Hello, and thank you for joining us here on the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is longtime friend, colleague, and one of the most interesting people I know, Michael Hertz. Michael is a senior leader with Progeny Systems and co-founder of Empowering Haitians, a nonprofit that seeks to create economic opportunity, self-sufficiency, and sustainability solutions in Haiti. Michael, thank you for being on the podcast today. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. So let's let's jump right into uh, let's jump right into it. You ha- you have a fascinating backstory. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I moved around a lot as a as a child. My dad was a kind of a late starter, getting his PhD and um, and well college degrees after I was born. Um, and so we moved around from his undergrad to his master's program to his PhD, and then through a um, succession of jobs. So I never stayed at the same school for longer than two years up until high school. And then, and then I had that stability. Wow. So that, so I kind of was an itinerant kid growing up. Uh, and then I came out to, um, during that time we had, uh, my, my dad's, my favorite uncle lived out here in Virginia and, uh, in a little farm and, uh, and what we, my brother and I would come out and, it, and I would get to basically be Tom Sawyer to his Huck Finn um, for a week at a time on a farm, you know, right. very little adult supervision and wide open spaces. And uh, so Virginia became this, this, this mecca to me. And so then when I graduated college or graduated high school, UVA, the two best schools in the nation were Cal Berkeley, which was 80 miles away in in-state and UVA, which is the furthest possible place you could be in out of state. So of course I went out of state. And then I uh, yeah. came to Virginia and got a master's degree. And then in the process of that, uh, met my wife. And uh, so we, we agreed that we would stay in, in Virginia because her parents were here for a year. And we're here 20 years later. So <laughs> 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 I haven't really, haven't really moved on. Um, but so in my, between my master's and my PhD research, we started doing, I started doing um, like international studies or in, international systems engineering. Mm-hmm. That, that would study things like how a U.S. based firm would go into a foreign country and use U.S. standards for either construction or they would make basic assumptions about how things would be maintained or worked on or operated. And then they would leave and then bad things would happen, you know, like the famous incident, like the Bhopal incident and some of these things where right. U.S. engineers or, or, you know, quote unquote, first world country uh firms would say well if, of course everybody does preventative maintenance you know not everybody does preventative maintenance and then so some hugely bad thing would happen so i kind of had this in my uh had this stuff in my head and then i was asked to go to haiti um just to be a grunt laborer and i just again i fell in love with the place so i wow. the, the, the wow. island is beautiful the people are beautiful but the problems there were the types of things that i felt like i could really use my engineering background to help solve and it was international so there was all these things about how it tied into my academic research and then and then i uh, i just just love the types of things we're doing there and then like any like anything you need to have a buddy and so we met a guy uh, met a guy there who was uh you know he's extremely competent and and just a really fun spirit and a community leader and so he and I meshed very well. And so that was, that was the beginning of whatever, 15 years of going to Haiti a couple of times, two, three times a year and, and starting Empowering Haitian. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. And, and just rewinding a little bit, you also, while you were at UVA, you played football for them, didn't you? Yeah, yeah for uh, first semester, I walked onto, the, walked onto the team as the long snapper and uh, it was short-lived glory. <laughs> <laughs> But still, <laughs> yeah. But still, <laughs> <laughs> no. That's that's uh that that's pretty amazing. I think you know one of the one of the primary reasons why I wanted to have you on was because I I do consider you one of the most interesting people I know, and 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 what I'm hoping to get at is some of that secret sauce for how you go about being interesting, being interested, how you develop confidence and, um, and how you work a room, you know, so that's, that's a little bit about, you know, 
a little bit about you know why I wanted to have you on. So how how do you define an interesting person? Like what makes a person interesting to you? So I think I think the sh short answer is that they're passionate about something. And so I think there's people that are passionate about things uh, that can be quite divisive. So, you know, you could take any of the current things that are going on in the news. You could take something that doesn't, that shouldn't be divisive, like school openings or face mask wearings, and yet right. they are. And right. um, so I find it interesting people to be people that can be, they don't have to just agree with me. And generally it's more interesting that they don't, but that they can, they can articulate their passion in a way that's not off-putting so that, yeah. so that both people can feel like, I have a great idea and I really know how to express it. You have a great idea and you know how to express it and we're never going to actually come together, but it's at least, uh, at least an interesting thing. And then of course, it's way easier to find someone interesting who's, who agrees with you. So if you, you have right. two people that are, that, <laughs> right. that right. think, uh, whatever, any number of things that, that agree with you, then, then, it, um, uh, then they're pretty interesting. I, I think one of the things that I try to seek out are people, I think we all seek out birds of a feather. We all seek out people that are, are like us, but I like to find people that are slightly orthogonal to, to my beliefs so that I can think of, um, well, you know, my brother, Ben, he's a very smart guy and yeah. he's very, very left. And so, so any discussions with him, you know where he's going to come at it, but he's going to come at it as a smart person. And, uh, and then I have, we, we have mutual friends that are very far to the right. right. And again, smart people that are articulate and you can have these political discussions with far left and far right and more centrist people, as long as it's the respected people's opinions and then they're, and then they are able to convey it without getting you know, mean. <laughs> so how does someone go from, in your, in your mind, how does someone go from being not interesting to interesting? How do they make that walk? I think it's all about curiosity. Uh, you need to, throughout your throughout your whole life, the the people that are the people that have something to say are the people that are curious. The people that are like, I wonder what happens if I do this. I wonder instead of just finding out, um, you know, you read some fact and instead of stopping at the fact, going one or two levels deep. The uh, one of the guys I work with at work, who's you know pretty successful. He's always taught me that you always have to be two levels deep at any, at any, any kind of brief, any kind of conversation. If you, you have to know what the first question is going to be and the answer to that, and then the, the follow-up question to that and the answer, and then anything past that, you can always say, well, I don't know. I'll look it up or I'll come back to you or whatever. So if you can be two levels deep on a topic, then you're very interesting in that topic. And then if you're broad enough and curious enough to have a lot of that, um, you know, a lot of that depth or breadth, then you can, then you can, um, you can be interested. Hmm. So one of the things that I've always found fascinating about you is your ability to work a room. How do you, how do you do that? I think there's probably, I think there's a little bit of, um, so if you think of a room of people with, um, uh, or charismatic people is having a kind of a gravity. You can look at a room and you can kind of see who people want to talk to because there's a person in the middle and they may be having a conversation with one or two people, but there's hanger on, there's people who want to go talk to that person next as soon as there is an availability. And if you look at a room of any, any reasonable size, you can see yeah. there's, um, there's these gravity wells of people that are interested. So obviously, if you don't know anybody, those are the places to go see because if I don't know anybody in a room, I know who the important people are, the interesting people are. And if I do know the people in the room, I either agree with that gravity well, or I'm like, oh, I don't want to go talk to that guy. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to go over here and find somebody else that I want to talk to. So that's, that's one way that I would work a room is just trying to figure out, you know, who's who in the zoo and then, yeah. um, and then try to determine what's going on. And then the, the unfair secret sauce that people do, you know, Everybody does it. It's just try to do, you know, you, if you, how well you do it is to be in a conver a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but really be listening to the conversation to the, mm -hmm. to the right or left of you and right. make the person that you're talking to not feel like you're doing that and be discreet enough that the person that you're eavesdropping on doesn't know that you're eavesdropping on. Them. 
Yeah. So, there's, so then you get a little bit of intel, a little bit of insight about what's going on in a broader sense, and then you can use that to, to initiate conversations or to exit a conversation if the one you're having isn't pleasant. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. How do, you, how do you do that now in a virtual environment? Oh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's basically impossible to do, to do what I was suggesting yeah, as far as work in a room like that. I think now it's all about, um, it's all about the, it's, you know, the uh, quality of the, um, was the quality of the content of the person. So, so people in a, in a virtual manner either contribute, uh, not all comments are the same or equally valuable. And so some people only speak when they have something interesting to say and other people, you know, are full on broadcast mode all the time and it's blah, 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 blah. Right. And I think trying to identify those people, the um, the ones who provide good content, um, that's the. I mean, that's a, that's currently the struggle. So another thing that's always impressed me about you is your level of confidence, and and I'll caveat that by saying that I consider you a very confident person, but not an arrogant person, um, and and there's and 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 that's a very that's a very challenging line to walk, I think. Um, but I consider you very humble. Was confidence always a part of you? Like, was it something you always had, or was it something that you developed over over the course of your life? Well, I, I really attribute any any confidence. To, so I, I mentioned that I moved around a lot uh, yeah. as a kid. So my brother went to four schools in four years. So he never got out of being the new kid. And I think that helped him create a, create a personality that says, Hey, you don't know me, but I think I'm okay. And you're going to like me. And so he would go do that. And so I really learned a lot from, learned a lot from gaining confidence based on my brother. Um, and then being a kid that moves around all the time, like you don't have time. <laughs> you don't have time to self doubt. If you're, otherwise you're always lonely. You're always the kid eating lunch by himself. So I think that one, one thing about how I, I gained confidence and then um, tell a story. Uh, so there's, there's some aspect of it that has to be innate because I, I remember like everybody of our age uh, watching the video, the challenger explosion. And mm, so yeah. I was in PE, they took us out of PE, brought us into the room, you know, rolled the, the big TV card out there to show us the, um, show us the challenger accident. And and then, you know, it was kind of on a loop of just, you know, show, going, going, going. And yeah. all the kids were like, the teachers are crying and the kids are kind of didn't know what, what emotions to be. And they were talking to me. And I, and I go, shh, NASA needs me. Like, because I needed to study that video. I needed to figure out why it exploded. I, the third grader or whatever grade, I, yeah, it's third grade. I was going <laughs> to yeah, figure, or yeah. fourth grade, I, I was going to figure out how to, uh, to, to, determine what caused the challenger explosion so uh mary lou my my wife uh, teases me all the time about that that sense of like who the heck do you think you are that (laughs) that that nasa needs me so that's a that's a catchphrase in our house for when i'm uh a little too (laughs) self-confident yeah yeah (laughs) how would you coach someone uh in in their own self-confidence how would you bring them along i would say that uh that the biggest mistake people make in a broad variety of things is that they let the world tell them no. They say, I'm not good enough. I'm not pretty enough or handsome enough. I'm not strong enough. I, there's no way I can do X, Y, Z. And I really believe that you don't say no to yourself. You go off and then try to do it. And then the world is always going to say, no, 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 no. And you may, they may be right. You may not be pretty enough or strong enough or fast enough or whatever, but, but you don't, but don't, don't stop before you even try. So mm. I tell people, don't, yeah. don't say no to yourself. And then to recognize that uh, it's very, that the human nature is that you focus on your inadequacies way more than you focus on your, than most people, than they focus on your strength. So uh, to recognize that you may not be the, that just because you're not the best person at a tech, uh, uh, at a thing, 
doesn't mean that, hey, you're the second best at a whole wide range of things. And so you need, you could be a lot more confident. Like being, again, being broad is, is oftentimes better than being deep. Hmm. What do you think is the biggest impediment to people's confidence? I think that the biggest impediment is that when people uh, uh, fail at a task, they determine that that failure is a broad, instead of saying, um, it's like, again, my kids on a math test, <laughs> they get a bad grade on a math test and they can either say, I did bad on that test, on that concept, that's that piece of material, or they could say, I'm bad at math. Mm -hmm. I think that I think mm -hmm. if right. people that are uh, confident recognize, they, they attribute, they attribute um, bad outcomes to either they were unprepared and they could have done more beforehand, or it's just a one off, a bad day. You know, I was sick that day. I didn't study as much as I should have, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So I think, uh, I, I think that's the biggest impediment is that people overgeneralize, um, <clears throat> overgeneralize failure causes. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a, an incredible answer, actually. One of the things that I've heard is that in order to be interesting, you have to be interested. Uh, to what degree do you agree or disagree with that statement? Yeah, I, 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 I think you ha absolutely have to have something that, that, uh, that makes you want to talk about it, that you, you have some, some content or some subject that, that you care enough about that you want to go off and do. Uh, I think that <clears throat> that people often often self-select and say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in you. I think you know this about me. I'm, I do a lot of home automation stuff. Yep, and, yep. and a large portion of the people I talk to would not, they wouldn't care at all about it. But then a handful of, a handful of colleagues, we talk about it all the time. And, and, and so I, you could be interested in sports and follow a sports team and be able to talk to some people about sports. Mm. And then you can also talk about stupid little microcontrollers for opening and closing blinds or whatever. And so uh, I, I think you absolutely have to be interesting. They're interested in things in order to be interested. I think, I think too, another one of those things that, that I try to do is to really have a broad, a broad, uh, you know, the one layer or two level deep on, on a broad topic. Back, back when we used to have sports, I would follow right, a little bit about right. NASCAR. I would, even though I don't really, I, I don't know that I've ever watched a whole NASCAR event, but I would know who won the Daytona 500. I would, mm. I would definitely know about, um, mm. about local sports teams, but I would also know, you know, broad topics. And so those types of things, if you go work a room or work a bar, like you have to be able to you have to be able to know enough because you don't know if the guy you're about to go talk to is a huge NASCAR fan. And if all you know about is college basketball, you're not going to be interesting to him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Right. What sort of things do you read on a, on a regular basis to help you to stay relevant and interesting? So I, so I used to do, uh, I used to try to curate a Twitter feed of interesting people. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's gotten a little, I mean, this is probably four years ago. So I think Twitter has gotten a little bit harder to do that. It harder for me to do that. Both yeah. just with the, the, just the volume of volume of nonsense. Um, so I, I, um, I have a handful of websites that I go to, but then basically I use Reddit is my, is my go-to, go-to feed. So I have the five or six things that I'm interested in. And then I feel like, I feel like in a very short period of time, 30 minutes a day or something, I can really get, I can get headlines and then I can, uh, I can go one or two levels deep because somebody synopsizes an article and then I feel like, oh, that article is interesting enough for me to go read. And then it's really offloading. Reddit has allowed me to offload like my own uh, going down the rabbit hole. I let other people go down the rabbit hole and just kind of cheat and jump straight to the bottom of it. So <laughs> right, right. that's one of the things that I try to do. And then my, um, and then I have a, these great resources in, in that my teenagers are interesting and my wife is interesting. So then they will also, they will also spur uh, discussions on things. So um, like, again, when, where, the way I, where I grew up and the way I grew up, there was not a whole lot of LGBYQ or whatever the, whatever the acronym uh, right. Right. <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, um, 
everything was very uh, closed, closeted as, as it were. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. for my daughter, it's all right there in the open. And so it's, <clears throat> it's a completely different high school experience. And so then she gives me things to go read and I read about that, about what it means to be a teenager. Because I know what it meant to be a teenager in a closed world. And then she gives me this stuff about what it means to be a teenager in an open world. And, and uh, so again, it's just it's be, having interesting people around you it make you a little bit more interesting yourself. One of the things that I also noticed about you is that you, you do a lot of interesting things. I mean, you not only surround yourself with interesting people, but you, you travel, you go to Haiti a few times a year and you, you take advantage of opportunities to travel with your job and things like that. For someone who doesn't have those kind of opportunities or, or resources, what can they do to make themselves interesting? <clears throat> no, that's an interesting question uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that I don't know that I, I, would, I would argue with anybody um, that I think that, that I mean, this is pre-COVID, mm -hmm. but uh, right. that, so it's kind of almost useless because we're in the COVID world, but that if you pay it, so when Mary Lou and I were first married, we didn't have, didn't have a whole lot of uh, nickels to rub together, but we would. I would watch the uh, internet for for sales, for flash sales, for go to go to uh, Italy for three days for a hundred bucks, or we you know we went to yeah. Egypt for eleven days at at something you know for basically free or very very little. So there's a there's an aspect of that. Yeah hard to find and you got to be flexible to go find those opportunities when you don't have so what uh resources allow you to do is plan ahead and think about where you want to go and 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 evaluate that kind of a thing where if you don't have resources you you don't get those opportunities but then right. in the covid world things that i think that you can do are there's a lot of there's a lot of uh you know still um Lincoln's phrase, there's a lot of hallowed ground that you can go and, and see. And it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, a battlefield or the uh, Smithsonian, but there are places to go where really momentous things happen. And then to walk, walk in this, walk in the, um, to walk in the footsteps of those people who came before you or to imagine what had happened there and the impact that it happened to the world, I think those are just as valuable. So you can, you can, you can stand in awe of, of what happened at Antietam or Gettysburg the same way that you can at the Colosseum in Rome. And yeah. one does better Instagram photos, but, they, but they're, both, they're both significant. So I think that in the age of COVID, there's gonna be a lot more finding the hallowed ground around you than it is about mm -hmm. um, you know, bucket list travel of items. Yeah, I could see that. What is the, the key to your success? I think, I think the thing that's enabled me the most is that um, I think, you know, everybody will say, hey, your family and all that stuff, which is absolutely true. You know, my, my parents and brothers and, and then later on my wife and people certainly certainly enabled me to do what it what it was that I what I it, what it was that I wanted to do but I think really the secret to my the secret sauce of my success is is hustling I mean there was and when I was in college I had three jobs um you know in grad school I worked you know in grad school I worked every job every every uh, shift that I could get and then when I got out of grad school and started working at um, Lockheed Martin. It's anybody want to work overtime? Yeah, boss, I'll work overtime. Anybody want to do this? Yes, yeah, boss, I'll do that. And so then you get a, um, in psychology, there's a concept of a halo effect, meaning that if you're really good at the beginning, then, then if you slack off a little bit or slack off or have a bad thing that happens a little bit later on, everybody says, oh, it, you know, he has a halo. He's really good. He just screwed up here. If you don't get the halo and you can only get it at the beginning, then, then you have that screw up event, and now they start to say, Ooh, well, maybe you're not as good as I thought, or maybe you're just average, or whatever. So, I think hustling always enabled me to, to generate a halo effect. Yeah. And the, uh, 
the other one would be this is this is from my brother uh that so i had a job as a construction guy and uh and i mean i was the lowest guy on the total pole so i'm 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 carrying stuff and my brother said hey when you don't have anything in your hands jog back to wherever it is that you're going and then rest when you're carrying things so no one's going to yell at you for going walking slow or walking when you're carrying a bunch of tools but when your hands are empty you run so i did that for probably a week and then uh unbeknownst to me the owner of the company had was watching me do this and just thought i was the craziest hard worker ever and so then i got a tractor that i got to drive around on the thing so then i didn't have to carry anything anymore and like put everything right. in the bucket. and right. so it's, it's there's totally this concept of i think hustling true hustle matters and then the appearance of hustle also matters <laughs> <laughs> that's that's brilliant that's brilliant what do you want most for your life again it's a it's a tough question because i i think that when i was younger i really wanted to really wanted to have a life that measured something that that you could see you could see the mark you know hopefully a good mark but the, <laughs> that you could see the mark on the ground where you where you did something and as i've gotten a little bit older and I, as my kids have gotten older feel a lot less um, need for that. I feel a lot more uh, need to um, be in the moment. I, mm -hmm. when, I was, when I was young, when I was in eighth grade, I couldn't wait to get to high school and high school, college, college, grad school, grad school, married, married, job, good job, better job, best job. And then, and then you look back like, man, I spent all my life looking forward to something and not any time in the moment. And so I think that I think that always hustling causes is there's a there's opposite forces there of, of hustling because you hustle to get to the next thing and then to be present to enjoy the hustle <laughs> as it were. Right. Um, and so I, I think for what I want to do for my life is is uh, to make sure that it's not about the acclimation of of awards or things or or stamps in your passport that it's about the moments that you have when you're doing those things in order to, to, you know, to have a life that was good and not necessarily was measured. Hmm. What, what was the tipping point that made you see that differently? Probably, probably just my children, having them keep saying, oh, I can't wait for, oh, I can't wait for. And then, I mean, we just, just did this. We were going to the beach. My daughter has been excited about the beach, nonstop talking for about a month. And then the day before we leave, she's like, I can't wait to when we get back and I get to go do X, Y, Z. And, and those types of things really, over the course of the last 10 years, it really made me realize that I've been doing the same thing, but on a much more macro scale. I, I, I skip ahead two years. I can't wait till I get out of college. I can't wait to like, you know, whatever. So I, um, that's really been the tipping point is that I recognize that my children are doing the same thing that I did and it's kind of annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it's very humbling too, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they hold up the mirror to you. Yeah, here you go, dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't mean. <laughs> if you could give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? I would say it's something along the lines of compassion or humility that that a lot of what we a lot of the issues that we face in the society is that we uh we spend too much time thinking about how if somebody else gets something that it takes something away from me and that that overall the world is plenty big for everybody to to get what they need and get what they want and um and so when your friend or brother-in-law gets a promotion that has nothing to do with you and you're promotion or not getting a promotion. If your friend buys a boat, it has nothing to do with you buying a boat, right? There's still plenty of boats out there. If you want to go buy one, you can go buy one. Right, and, right. and I think that we, as a, as a society and as a world, we spend way too much time, you know, outwardly thinking that anything, anything that happens to somebody else somehow impacts me and a, you know, a good thing to them is a bad thing to me. How do you want to leave the world better than you found it? Well, I think uh, I think it's important to me. Um, I, I hope uh, very strongly that this, the work that we've been doing in Haiti uh, mm -hmm. continues on after we're, we're gone. Um, 
So we, we've been working with a medical mission there that's been going on since the 80s. And um, there's some, some concern that it's going gonna, it's gonna to go away just because of attrition of the medical team and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I, hope that, I hope that my children and my friends that have gone to Haiti with us, that they pick up, they pick up the mantle and say, hey, you know, we're gonna, we're not gonna forget about Haiti when mom and dad are gone. That we're gonna keep going and doing that. So I, I really hope that, I hope that, for a place that's as close as it is, that um, that that I that I positively do that. I hope that there's a at least a generation, at least a generation after me that goes and continues. Hopefully, to the point where they they don't need to go anymore. That Haiti is a beautiful, great place, and you know there's stability and whatnot. That seems unlikely. <laughs> is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be helpful for me or for our audience members to know? I don't, I don't really think so. I think we've covered, you know, the things that I really, I do really think that are important. Like it, I think it's important to, to have confidence in yourself and make, or that, to not make broad generalizations on failure events. I think it's important to, to have a, to, uh, to at least know a little bit about things that you don't care about, just so that if someone does care about it, you can smooth over social conversations. I think those are the types of things that really um, enable, you know, enable someone to work a room or enable someone to, to be the guy that people invite to dinner parties, right? To be the, oh, we have an extra seat at the table uh who, who do we want right and so the you know hamilton's going crazy you know these days and yes. and the only way the only way to ever you have to be in the room where it happens and so to be in the room you know you got to be you got to have a little bit of charm or you got to have a little bit of something that people want to have in that room with them yeah if you want to be found online uh where where can people find you and connect with you so you can find uh empowering haitians is empoweringhaitians.org um, it's probably the best way to find me. Uh, I don't really, I'm a much more of a consumer of content than I am of a creator of content. But the, that would be the, that would be the place to, that would be the place to go. Look. That's awesome. Michael, thank you so much. This has been absolutely brilliant. I'm, I'm grateful for the time and, uh, and, and you sharing all of your wisdom. Thank I you. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you.